I'm Jordan Weissman, and this is Hairbrain Schemes. Hi, Kickstarter! Since we brought back Shadowrun with Shadowrun Returns, the question we constantly get is, when are you bringing back Battletech? And the answer is, today. I'm proud to announce that Hairbrain Schemes is going to make a turn-based, tactical mech combat game that is steeped in the deadly feudal politics of the classic Battletech setting. Now, I've been making mech games a long time. Over 30 years ago, I created the first version of Battletech as a miniatures board game and an accompanying role-playing game called Mech Warrior. Over the years, we've explored the Battletech universe through a variety of different media, including hundreds of different novels, an animated television show, and even the Battletech centers, where players could get into fully operational cockpits and pilot mechs in a 3D multiplayer arena. Of course, Battletech is best known for its many video games, including the first, Crescent Hawk's Inception in 1988, the breakout hit Mech Warrior 2 in 1995, Mech Commander, the first tactical game in 1998, and of course, the current Mech Warrior Online. Not only have I been making mech games for a long time, so has Mitch. The first one we worked on together was Mech Commander, and I mean, then he went on to do the whole series. Uh, the thing I've always loved about Battletech is the universe, especially the original setting of classic Battletech. The year is 3025, and for over 200 years, the great houses who dominate the planets of the Inner Sphere have battled each other to claim the title of First Lord and rule from the throne of a reconstituted Star League. The tool of conquest is mankind's most powerful and versatile fighting vehicle, the Battle Mech, adaptable to every planetary environment and with enough firepower to level a small city. With technology in decline after two centuries of war, mechs are precious, rare, and piloted by the nobility. Handed down from generation to generation, they represent the family's heritage, its fealty, and its future. Now, as the Third War of Succession grinds down, the exhausted noble houses look to mercenaries to continue the fight. And that's where you come in, as the commander of your own mercenary outfit. I'd like to introduce Mike McCain, creative director of the Shadowrun series. He'll be leading the Battletech game with me. I grew up playing Battletech games. Uh, in fact, MechWarrior 2 is one of the first PC games I ever played. So I'm really excited to be working with Jordan and the team here to create a modern, turn-based, tactical mech combat game for PC. First off, I like how it's going to be modern now because the young guy's involved. Anyway, as Mitch said... <laughs> On the battlefield, you'll command a lance of four mechs in turn-based combat, unleashing their awesome firepower and utilizing their mech warrior's unique abilities. To realize all of this action on screen, we'll be taking advantage of Unity 5 to make the 3D battlefield experience as immersive as possible. Your previous support has allowed us to deliver four games that we're really proud of. And the success of those games gives us the resources to build a great single-player skirmish game in which you can pit your mechs against enemy AI mechs. But with your support, that base game can become so much more. As you can see below, our vision for the game expands in four stages. Stage one is already paid for. It's the skirmish game we're funding ourselves. If our Kickstarter hits funding stage two, we can create a single-player story campaign for the game. In this campaign, you'll command your own mercenary outfit, struggling to survive from mission to mission amidst the feudal political turmoil of the Inner Sphere. The campaign will feature an original new story set in the deadly 3025 era of the Battletech universe. You'll be given missions with a variety of objectives, from sabotaging an enemy installation while posing as a lance from a rival house, to kidnapping a minor noble in order to help uh, aid a client's negotiating position. Between those missions, you'll manage the finances and logistics of your mercenary outfit, from the modifications and loadouts of your mechs to the salaries and skill growth of your mech warriors. If we hit funding stage three, we can expand that mercenary campaign to make it much broader and open-ended, to put you in full control of your destiny as a mercenary. So alongside the core story campaign, you'll be able to take contracts from the various noble houses of the Inner Sphere. Over time, the missions you accept and the objectives you complete will determine your reputation as a mercenary and what contracts will be available to you in the future. To make the game open-ended, we'll add a variety of side contracts and procedural mission generation so that you can grow and expand your mercenary outfit both during and after the campaign. Funding Stage 4 adds PvP multiplayer set in the famous arenas of Solaris 7. You'll be able to take your lance to the arena to fight head-to-head -head with your friends or to compete in ranked leaderboard play. We've planned Battletech to expand in these stages so we can be confident we'll make a great game regardless of the funding level we hit. But of course, the more co-funding we can raise here on Kickstarter, the bigger the game we can make. So let's work together to bring classic turn-based Battletech back to the PC. Once again, Kickstarter, we thank you for your faith in us, and we look forward to making another great game with you. All right, you suck. Let's try again.
All right, here we are on GPS. I'm Jay LaRock, and I am joined by Ignacio. And I mean, guys, I, I, I wish I could have like a resume like this. I mean, look at this. Creator of Battletech, MechWarrior, Shadowrun, Crimson Skies, and like tons more. I mean, man, I, I, I need to get on my knees and start saying, I, we aren't worthy. We're not me. worthy, I mean, man. We're, seriously, we're joined by Jordan Weissman. Thanks for coming on the show. I mean, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure, guys. Thanks so much. All right, so I mean, I, I could say that here we're trying to promote, you know, your Kickstarter, but I mean, it's funded. I mean, but obviously we're looking at stretch goals because I mean, this is awesome. So the more and more people know about it and see how awesome it is, the more that could be added. Yeah, we're uh, we we just uh, we just passed the two million dollar mark, um, which means uh, you know we've got the. Um, uh, open-ended uh, mercenary uh, campaign funded, and um, and we just passed the the goal of being able to have a customizable uh, home base, uh, you know, which I think would be a great deal of fun. And we're making progress towards uh, hitting multiplayer, uh, which would be uh, extremely exciting. Yeah, I was looking at that, and uh, I was wondering if you guys do hit that goal, uh, are you going to add another stretch goal, maybe, like another stage? Uh, no, I think if, uh, our, our plan is if we're lucky enough to, to get to 2.5, um, uh, all the money after that will go into funding a live team that will allow us to continue to make uh, more content and add additional features after launch. Uh, so, for instance, one of the ones uh, that people have really been looking for is uh, <clears throat> being able to have co-op missions. Uh, yeah. And so that would be one of the things that we would, uh, you know, use the the additional funding for, uh, and you know, for the live team and to have them work on on features like co-op and, and additional missions um, to add to, um, you know, the contracts that would be available from the major houses. Oh, okay. And uh, just in general, is the game going to be sort of like an open-ended game where you're either working for a house or you're working as a mercenary and just bouncing from contract to contract? Um, just in general, like, what, how's the game going to be like when you're in the main menu and you're, like, planning missions and whatnot? So uh, the, the single-player game, uh, there are two modes. There's a skirmish mode, uh, which is where you can, you know, pick any of the, any of the maps, <clears throat> um, design your own, uh, your lance, design uh, opponent, opponents of whatever size you want, plop them down and, and go at it, you know, so you can keep challenging yourself with skirmish uh, mode um, battles. <clears throat> and then there'll be the campaign. The campaign oh, okay. part. Um, the campaign will start kind of more as a story-centric campaign <clears throat> in a uh, an area of the periphery. <clears throat> and then as you uh, advance through that, then the, it'll kind of open up and and move into becoming an open-ended campaign. So as you build your reputation out in the periphery as a small unit, then as your reputation grows, then you start to become you know um, more interesting to the great houses, and you get involved into the politics of the great houses. You know, there in that thirty twenty-five era. And then it opens up into open ended where you can just keep going <clears throat> um, <clears throat> to uh, improve your reputation with the different houses or with the different factions. Oh, okay, good, good. Yeah, so it's it, really it open ended. Like, it looks like Comcast really did uh, hate me. <laughs> it just wanted to attack me, so I, I, I guess that's what happened here. It, it, it was bound to happen. Um, as far <laughs> as, you know, when you first came out, I mean, it obviously looked like something that was just bound to. To, to be funded, but obviously, you know, there must have been a risk that it could be something that was going to take its time. Once you saw that so many people were interested and you and you knew that it was going to be something that was get funded, um, how did you come about the plans to create the stretch goals? Well, this was all, <coughs> excuse me, um, this is something we had to do a lot of planning before uh, we even went to Kickstarter, um, because we have to, uh, one, you know, the, the base game, the skirmish level game, we're funding ourselves. Right, so that 250,000 that represented the first funding goal, that is a small fraction of what it takes to actually make a game. You know, uh, that was really just to add the combined arms, which was the first of the stretch goals. So we we started from the very beginning with stretch goals. The base game was already funded by us. You know, um, okay. but each of those stretch goals we had to do research on. Um, you know, beforehand so that we were able to to really get a sense of what you know what it's going to cost to be able to add these features. Um, so that that roadmap was was all. Kind of researched uh, before before the Kickstarter went live. And now we were overwhelmed at how fast we moved through uh, the beginning of this. It's, it's been you know the, the fan response has been fantastic and we're deeply appreciative. 
Uh, but we we really did you know a lot of the homework uh, uh, beforehand to make sure that we were only being a, only you know committing to things that that we could actually execute on. Yeah, and I mean it funded like really fast. Like I I haven't seen the Kickstarter fund so quickly. Like maybe Kung Fury or something that exploded in like one day. It's the only thing I've seen that that quick to fund. Yeah, uh, seriously. Yeah, the the thing, you know we kind of have we we circulated this idea of alpha strikes. Um, you know, beforehand to a lot of the fan communities, and, and they showed up, and man, did they alpha strike it! I mean, it was just like <laughs> day one. You know, we did a million bucks in the first day. That was that was great, and it really you know meant that we knew we were going to be able to make a, a really robust game here. You know, the really thing that's cool is because uh, now my, I myself I I didn't know that much about the board game aspect. But we have some people that really know a lot about the tabletop aspect, and I was more the kind of person that came in later with like Mech Warrior playing the PC games and stuff like that. For people who like really are into the board game and and love that kind of tabletop aspect, can you tell us a little bit about maybe how the differences between that and then what you're creating here? <clears throat> yeah, sure. So um, uh, this is a turn-based game, uh, <clears throat> uh, and our goal is to um, capture the essence of what makes Battletech Battletech, right? The, the trade-offs between heat and damage, movement and fire, um, the, the ability to, you know, customize max, uh, the way that they take damage in such detailed ways and the way that damage, you know, impacts the performance of the mech, um, all, you know, the relationship between the mech warrior and the mech, all those are the things we really want to make sure are in here. Um, the, the very specific mechanics of that I designed 30-some-odd years ago for the tabletop we're not trying to recreate those mechanics because, you know, computers aren't limited to only rolling six-sided dice, you know. Yeah. We can do so much more, um, you know, here and both make it more accessible and yet simultaneously also make it more de more deep and, and more detail for those things. Uh, so, our, so our goal is to, is to capture all of the essence and the feel of it, um, but, you know, but we're going to use slightly different mechanics to achieve those things. Um, so I think it it'll be our goal is that it would be um, familiar trade-offs, all the kind of tactical uh, risk reward relationship trade-offs that you make in in the in the game. Those should really feel the same. You know, uh, the mechs should feel the same in terms of what their capabilities are. Um, uh, you know, but we're gonna you know, for instance, we'll be expressing things in percentage chances of success as opposed to you know telling you you have to roll you know twelve or or better. You know, on two six-sided dice, so that would be a hard roll. But you know, you yeah. Know, um, so it is going to be, um, uh, I think, very familiar, but yet, but recreated in a different way. Um, we also want to make sure that the game is extremely accessible to people who came to um, BattleTech and MechWarrior through computer games, whether it was MechWarrior series or Mech Commander series. We want to make sure that you know that this isn't, um, you know, so um, you know, so many broken out to so many thousand of phases uh, uh, of a turn that it becomes you know uh, off-putting to to. Uh, computer players. Yeah, also, um, one thing that used to annoy me a lot, because, I mean, we Battletech used to be, like, one of our main games back uh, in middle school and high school with my friends. Uh, later on, we moved on to Shadowrun, because, you know, I don't know, it was kind of cooler sometimes. But, um, like, in the computer... It, it resolves everything quickly for you. Like, let's say you're firing four SRM-6s. So it's like, oh, look, uh, all six missiles hit. All right, let's roll six times. Oh, boy, here we go. You know, oh, how many of those launchers do you have? Oh, I have, like, six of them. All right, let's roll, you know, like, 50 freaking times, you know? Yes. Yeah, no, I know. The, the uh, you know, the, the, the downside of having a detailed damage system is the number of die rolls it took you to resolve it. Oh, yeah. Um, and, oh, uh, all the critical. I'll check for critical. Where did it go? Where's the critical? You could spend, you know, more, more of the game rolling the dice than making the decisions, you know? Yeah. Uh, and so, obviously, in a computer game, that's one of the advantages. We don't, you don't have to worry about any of that kind of stuff. As far as uh, picking the wor uh, world, and I hope I'm not stepping on something Ignacio uh, asked earlier when I, my, my internet went out. But I mean, obviously, with you creating all, all you know, uh, being in creating the worlds, going with the Shadow Run world specifically, what was the reasoning in going specifically with that world? Because I mean, Ignacio schooled me in on on the uh, the world with Shadow Run, and like you said, that sounded really cool. Was there a specific reason with going with that specifically? 
Uh, you mean for the computer game or, or when I made the uh, world? No, f yeah, with making that world for this game that you're working on. Well, I mean, I think, uh, you know, both of these properties, both Battletech and Shadowrun, you know, had their roots in tabletop gaming, you know, 30-odd years ago. And, um, you know, I think uh, both of them reflect my um, passion for making rich, interesting worlds. Um, you know, what, what makes... Uh, and what makes, to me, a game uh, fascinating is something you'd want to stick with and play for a number of years is, is that it isn't just, you know, what's the thing you're shooting, right? It's why are you shooting it, right? Yeah. What, what is the, the, the personal reasons, what is the emotional contact and the geopolitical context in which, you know, this battle is taking place? Why does it matter, you know? Um, and to, to, to have good answers for that, you have to build a rich world that has fascinating characters and and logical geopolitical situations that will continue to kind of evolve and grind in interesting ways. You know, one uh, one of the guys working on the project with me, Mike McKean, who's a, I mean, he's he's you know uh, mid thirties, and he one of his first PC games ever was was playing Game Warrior Two. So he uh, you know he definitely had connection with it when he was a kid. But, you know, he never really read a lot of the lore until we started working on, on the Battletech game. Um, and he came to me, you know, about three or four months ago and said, you know, I've been reading all this stuff, and I don't know if you yeah. recognize it, but Game of Thrones is like the same exact structure yeah. as Battletech, right? Yeah, in terms much. of it's, it's, it's all the underlying... Houses. Yeah, everything worked. And I was like, yeah. And he was like, but Battletech's 10 years older than Game of Thrones. <laughs> and it's true. We have all that wonderful kind of feudal Machiavellian politics um, that are that underlie it. And uh, and that's what we really, in this Battletech game, want to bring to the forefront again. Because that was always one of the key parts, you know, back in the day with the novels and the, and, uh, the tabletop and the, you know, the modules was to really bring those characters and those storylines. And, and that's what we really want to do in this one, uh, in this game as well. Yeah, and on top of that, like, back in the days, it would be like, all right, you know, here's the rule book, but here's, like, these many source books about, like, families breeding and assassinating each other. <laughs> yeah, no, I know that. Those house books, um, the house books and all that, you know, all that, that wealth of material, I, I mean, I think that's one of the things that differentiated Battletech as, as a tabletop game 30 years ago is that it was, um, mechanically, it was a board game. But the way that we treated it, we treated it like a role-playing game, you know. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, and with the with the depth of fiction and world building that you would typically do in a role-playing game. Now, obviously, you know, you're working on a game that's going to be played on PC and also Mac, Linux, and also and and I know the Linux people are going to be like, what? But you know, with the resurgence of you know board games, tabletop games, people are loving that. Do you see yourself maybe thinking about? You know that could be something in the future where tabletop games are so popular nowadays that maybe that could be something off in the future. I love tabletop games. Uh, you know, I've been making them for uh, well since dinosaurs walked the earth, pretty much. And, um, and I don't ever want to stop making tabletop games. Um, we are uh, we work closely with the guys at Catalyst. Catalyst make the t the tabletop version of BattleTech um, and uh, the tabletop version of Shadowrun now. Uh, and both Randall and Lauren are are, are people I've worked with. Pretty much since they got in the industry. I mean, I think I think I was their first boss in both cases, and worked with them ever since. Um, and they're talented guys, and and um, and so I think um, we are working uh, in a way that hopefully will bring these uh, ideas that were you know and this revitalization of BattleTech uh, will be reflected on the tabletop as well. So if every so you're looking for a launch in early 2017, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, yeah. We're looking, uh, you know, someplace like around April, uh, twenty seventeen. It's about a about an eighteen month uh, development period for the game. And especially going f for PC, Mac, and Linux. I mean, does that make it more of a challenge than like if you just went straight for PC itself? Well, it used to quite a bit, uh, but now um, with uh, uh, underlying platforms like Unity, um, uh, which is what we're using for this game, Unity Five, uh, that complication uh, is largely. Um, uh, something that we don't have to deal with that, that they deal with now. Um, and so, uh, it, you know, if we were doing our own engine from scratch, it would have been very difficult for us to support all those platforms. But since we're built on top of Unity, um, it, uh, the amount of work uh, to support the platforms is a great deal less. 
one of the things that we always ask you know, when we have someone, especially someone that's created so many games, worked with so many games, is was there like a classic game that you, you know, loved or played a lot back in the, in the day? Oh, yeah. I mean, there are, you know, I think all of us can point to experiences where, you know, your life just went, yeah. <laughs> went oh, that's, a total, that's where I'm going now. Uh, that, that just, um, so, for me, I, you know, I, um, when I was a kid, I played a bunch of, like, the Avalon Hill strategy games, and, um, and those, were, those were cool, you know, uh, but then um, I was a, a camp counselor up in Wisconsin the year D&D came out. And one of the other counselors brought in a copy and played, and, and that was it. My brain just went, <laughs> um, and I was like, okay, well, that was you know stage one of making me who I am was was playing D and D, and I went back to you know I lived in Chicago, went back to my high school, and you know told all the guys about it, and we um, you know got a road trip together, drove back to Wisconsin, and went to go buy. D&D, at the time, the only place you could buy it was from Gary or Dave at Gary's house because um, this was nice. the, the very first year. So we went, and, and Dave Arneson was, you know, working the store uh, at the time, and, and we uh, bought a bunch of copies, and, and he was like, well, you want me to take you on a, you know, run you on a dungeon? I was like, yeah. So we <laughs> got in the kitchen, and, and he ran, you know, GM'd uh, a game for us. And, I, uh, and you know, later in life, after I started FASA and... and, and um, uh, I got to know both those guys really well and, and worked both a lot with both of them, and that was a that was a great joy. That was kind of part one, and then and then like many of us, my generation, you know, part two of, of my head exploding was you know uh, computers, and part three was Star Wars, you know, and and you put all those together, and and that was pretty much what my life became. Nice, good mix. Nice. <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, this this game. Oh, go go ahead, Ignacio. No, I was gonna tell you. Um, I, I'm one of those people that actually loves uh, Crimson Skies. <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, man. I love uh, that. Yeah. Like even uh, I have a bunch of the books and the the figures. I have like this limited edition uh, oh, <laughs> Santa Claus <laughs> that I got on eBay. <laughs> I just have it laying here for no reason. <laughs> Well, I, I, that's one I'd love to get back to one day too. I really, it's really one. Um, I really love that universe and that era. Um, and so, yeah, that's 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 on my list to, to try to get back to. And certainly something we talk to Microsoft all the time about. You know, getting us, uh, giving us the opportunity to do that. Oh yeah, yeah. Because I mean, that, that PC game came out, and and I love it. But I played it so many times that it's like, I'm I'm done with it. Kind of <laughs> like I memorized the dialogue. <laughs> uh, and then, like, that Xbox game came out, and maybe another one did, and then it's been, like, how many years? Like, been a long time. 10 or something? I think the PC, the Xbox one was... 2003, maybe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's been over 10 years, yeah. But yeah. it's basically, it's, it's, it's an awesome universe. It's alternate history of... You know, everybody's got an... Air, it's it's kind of like that Sky Captain movie, although that movie kind of sucks. Uh, mixed with the Rocketeer, mixed with like every like old radio show, uh, you know, it's all these dashing Indiana Jones, uh, Han Solo characters just dogfighting with these crazy alternate history airplanes and huge zeppelins. Uh, okay, I'm getting carried away, <laughs> but that, that's basically it. And like the Confederate States fighting like Texas and all these crazy alternate history things. <laughs> Well, yeah, I love I love you know I, I, every game I do is is uh, is rooted in history in some way. Um, you know, as as you said, uh, Crimson Skies is very very um, openly an alternate history. Uh, Shadowrun uh, was all based on uh, the history and mythology of um, the uh, uh, ancient Mayans and their and their calendar, which is which is you know how all of uh, um, the mythos of Shadowrun evolved. And and BattleTech is actually a pretty literal. Um, the retelling of the Roman successor states, um, you know, the whole idea of a very sophisticated uh, society um, that, through internal conflict, degrades, right, and just, and, 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 you know, all, has a retrograde of technology and of society, and, um, and that's what we're going through in the Battletech world, right, is that stuff that was made, you know, 100 years ago is better than the stuff that can be made now, um, and in that, that slide, uh, you know, slide down, and I think that's, uh, to me, it's an interesting place to set a game because it, you know, it, it's so counter to what we're, we're used to over the last, you know, 
couple centuries where everything new is better than everything old. But yeah. there are many things in human history where things that were old were better than things that are new. You know, and I think it's a fun one to uh, to to play in. Yeah, and also like, I mean, in in real history, we do see sometimes that it's like, oh, you know, why do you have this old junk? And it's like, well, it always works. <laughs> yeah. Like paper and pencil, you can always write something down. But if you consider the boot. I guess take out your cell phone, but if the cell phone doesn't work because of a nuclear bomb, well, you got other problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say listen, there might be a couple of things you need to focus on. Then the fact that you, you can't, you know, yeah, <laughs> something, you know, how about like eat something? Eat something would be good. You're not worried yeah. about eating. You're about eating. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> One of my calculus professors said. Uh, like, we kept asking, it was like, why are we learning this? Because, like, we could just, you know, plug it into the computer, sort of. And he's like, well, you know, if something were to happen, like a nuclear war, you're going to need to know this to, you know, be able to build computers again. And we're like, if we, if that happens, that's the, you know, the bottom of my priorities list. I'm, I'm more concerned about raiders raping me and food <laughs> and water. <laughs> Sleep, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Priorities, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Gotta get back to that basic, you know, pyramid of needs. Yeah. Um, well, do you want to mention just uh, you want to talk about maybe like just in case somebody's watching this and they don't know anything at all about BattleTech, just a general history lesson, like. Sure. It's like, oh look, we have a Star League, and uh, well, right. uh, not anymore. <laughs> BattleTech is a is a uh, uh, kind of a quote-unquote, hard science fiction uh, universe. Uh, it's uh, set in the... Uh, the game is set in the year 3025 um, on the back of um, uh, where he had uh, about for about, let's see, a thousand years, mankind has been in the stars, uh, spread out to about 2,000 planets of what's called the Inner Sphere, um, and uh, it organized at one point into what was called the Star League and and actually had a, you know, a, a classic golden period where... Um, you know, terraforming took place on all these planets, and, and uh, <clears throat> you know there was peace and prosperity for the most part. Um, and then that um, you know falls prey to uh, you know well humans greed um, and uh, uh, and kind of consumes itself in the five kind of major what are called houses, the the, the kind of family uh, feudal societies that were within um, the Star League. Then all start to um, um, you know, kind of beat on each other for the honor of being um, the, the head of the new Star League. Uh, we are now kind of at the third of those succession wars, which is where our game is set. Um, the weapon of, of choice, uh, the weapon that has evolved over those thousand years, is called the Battle Mech. Um, it is a, a mechanized walking uh, tank, uh, for all lack of a better word, that is um, anywhere from, uh, you know, 7 to uh, 15 meters tall. Um, carries an enormous amount of weapon uh, uh, firepower and, and was evolved to be able to work on the enormous diversity of planets um, that the inner sphere comprises. Of. Um, and so uh, your uh, role in this at this point is uh, as a mercenary. You, you're building a small mercenary company uh, inside of this uh, extremely chaotic feudal environment, uh, working for the different houses um, and, uh, and trying to keep your head above water financially uh, and your head attached to your so shoulders physically. Um, because it's a dangerous place, as you as you can imagine. Um, back back to history for one quick second. I mean, the reason um, uh, I wanted it to be a feudal society because I wanted to see the uh, mechs, which are effectively giant suits of armor, right, passed down from you know generation to generation, right? like armor and and a, and a great sword was during the Middle Ages. You know, um, they yeah. represented uh, enormous uh, wealth and enormous responsibility. You know, to the to the owners, um, and uh, so you have to you know step back and go. Well, why do feudal, why do feudal societies evolve, right? And if you kind of look at the history, um, feudal society and, and speed of communications are directly connected. If you can directly, if you can immediately communicate with people um, at distance, then you can kind of continue to command them. But if it takes you weeks and months for your commands to reach a distant location, now you have to put someone there who you trust, right? And historically, we've always trusted DNA more than anything else. So I put my DNA there. I put my, I put a relative there, 
right? Because um, I mean, the premise is they're more reliable and they're more trustworthy than someone who isn't. And that's how a feudal society develops. Um, and so for us to have a feudal society make sense in the science fiction setting, we needed to make sure that communications, interstellar communication, was really slow, right? So that you would then be inspired to, to, to place family members and, and develop back into that feudal environment. Turns out space is a really big place, so it's not hard to make communication slow, you know. Um, so uh, but that was just a little, little touchstone in terms of, you know, how the world was built. Oh, and uh, another thing to mention in the history is that the Star League was basically the golden era of mankind. As soon yes. as, like, the, there was, like, the House Cameron was, like, the, the leader of the, the well, the right. Star League. They get assassinated by this guy that conspired and befriended them and just murders them. And st While the General Kerensky was out fighting some thing they invented out there in the periphery, it was a ruse, and they all get brutally murdered, the entire family's gone, so it's like, all right, well, we have nobody next in line. So all the uh, house leaders, yeah, they, they basically are like, oh, I want to be leader, right? So they all start warring with each other. So yeah, yeah. the game's going to take place in the third succession war. Uh, what we haven't mentioned yet is the first and the second succession war basically involved uh, not even the scale of battle mechs yet. It's like warships, <laughs> like huge massive warships that would just annihilate each other or just be like, hmm, they have 50 warships there. Fire 200 nukes. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so yeah, no, you're absolutely right. That, I think it's that's a, how you it's create a dark age. <laughs> no, it's a very good note, right? In the first two succession wars, it was really unlimited warfare. And um, and they used you know nukes and they used uh, enormous firepower and and they destroyed they you know a number of planets became inhabitable uh, because of, of this level of, of, of warfare and so by the time we get to the third succession war it's you know what they're, okay. what they're not controlling a controlled war yeah, right calm it's, down calm down yeah it's like yes we still want to kill each other but let's not try to kill all of humanity in the process. Yeah. Um, and so they've kind of they've they've dialed it back into being battle mech only focused, and and nukes have been eliminated. Uh, you know, the orbital bombardment is eliminated. You know, they're they're kind of it's their equivalent of the Geneva Convention of how to wage war, um, in a in a quote unquote humane fashion. Which is yeah. really moron, right? I mean, how do you how do you how do you have war in a humane setting? But I guess you know, bottom line is you want to win, but you don't want to obliterate you know humanity. So. You know, you'll find some, some measuring point there. Yeah, so my like question a, is, is like, let's say, war. let's say you have someone like me who I have information on, like the Mech Warrior part. You know, I played a couple of the older games, but I don't know it, that much about the history. Obviously, I can go out and learn, but is it? Do you run the risk of maybe someone who's like, man, I, this history is rich. It's awesome, but I'm afraid that maybe if I jump in, I'll be over overwhelmed. No, it was something we're really conscious of, right? Because we were to invite new players into this, into the world of BattleTech, um, and and so we really are going to work hard to make sure that uh, that the game doesn't assume a prior knowledge of the lore, right? That it uh, that it brings you into it bit by bit in a really you know consumable fashion. Uh, we faced the same thing when we did the Shadowrun uh, uh, games recently with the you know Shadowrun Returns and uh, and Dragonfall in Hong Kong. Um, you know we didn't want to assume people knew what the Shadowrun world was or or that they understood all of the politics of it. And so we we had to introduce those stage by stage. Uh, and we'll do the same thing here. Um, the reason we we don't really want to you know kind of Create a, a very accessible version of, of this of the game and the universe, and, and don't want you to feel like you're going to have to go read you know five history books and seven novels before you can start playing. You know? I mean, you can, but just you, play you should, and, and then get into it. But you don't have to, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, when I when I listen to it, the because I mean, Ignacio has has uh, told me about this, and then I and I have other friends too that's told me about this before, and I'm like, man, this is awesome. But you know, I, I just think that obviously you have some people like, oh my goodness, you know, you hear about a great story. It's like sometimes when you hear about like Stargate, you tell someone about Stargate, and they're like, awesome, and then you're like, oh, ten season, they're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, no. <laughs> but then you start watching it, and you're like, okay, I guess I'm going to not shower for about three weeks as I watch this. And it's like, that's the same thing here. It's so awesome. You got to get into it. And, hey, that's the same thing. You know, 
with this, it's like, look, you got to go. You got to support this. Yes, it has funding. There's stretch goals. Go to their Kickstarter. Put that money in. Come on, you got to get with this. Uh, I appreciate that. That would be great. We'd love to we'd love to hit multiplayer. Uh, I think that would be a great deal of fun to be able to, you know, challenge friends around the world uh, to matches and, uh, and compete in the... Uh, within the fiction, there's a planet called Solera 7, uh, which is kind of the gladiatorial... Uh, home of gladiatorial mech combat, which is kind of like WWE, you know, um, you know, meets, uh, you know, what? Spartacus. Modern, <laughs> yeah, Spartacus. Yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, in giant mechs. Um, so that's, uh, that. it's really a fun uh, environment. And, and politically, it's kind of Switzerland. So there's like tons of spies there from all the houses and there's all kind of interesting components there. But uh, so that's where the multiplayer kind of fictionally takes place. And um, I think we're, we'd love to, Love to bring that to, to life, and, and hopefully uh, the fans will give us uh, the funds necessary to do so. Oh, yeah. Also, what's kind of cool about Solaris is that that, would, that was one of the planets where they would sometimes test out unproven weapons. Like, yep. hey, uh, here's a mech with a mace on it. I wonder if it's any good. I don't know. Go die and find out. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Oh, well, one thing I wanted to say... Uh, it's like I'm really glad you're putting it in 3025, which to me is like, as far as like the entire timeline of Battletech, as far as like fun to play stuff, to me that was like, it set the baseline, it set the standard, you know, pretty much before the clan stuff happened afterwards, <laughs> that everybody's like, oh, I want to be, I can shoot twice as fast, twice as long, I want to be clan all the time. Well, I think it, we, we. I was excited to start it there because I think the the kind of Machiavellian politics were the richest in that era, um, and uh, and the most accessible because you know like any any story that's been told for thirty years, uh, it's easier to to get started at the beginning than to come in you know thirty years later. So that's why one of the reasons we wanted to start here. But yeah, I appreciate one of the best uh, settings within BattleTech. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to tell you, just so you think about it, as maybe like a project to do in the future, make two RPGs for BattleTech. The first one is set in the Star League, and make uh -huh. the second one, and you work. The second one takes place as you could work as maybe two different conspiracy groups within Comstar. That would be uh -huh. kind of cool. Well, I think you know, we we want uh, you know Comstar to play a role in this game because. Uh, Comstar, um, as uh, we were talking about the communications that, that go yeah. between and one of the things that happened in the first succession war is the communication uh, capability started to be destroyed as part of uh, the battles and all yeah. of a sudden it's like we, people realized, oh wow, we, we, we have to be able to talk to, to these planets um, and so they, they all agreed to, um, to, to give all of the uh, communication technology to one um, neutral um, yeah. uh, entity uh, which became well, neutral. <laughs> yes. Well, it started as neutral, um, and uh, and then over the years, as the technological decline takes place, it starts to become this quasi uh, quasi religious organization. Yes. They they they're taking care of it by rote because they don't really understand some of the underlying stuff. Um, and yet, the political curve, as they start to realize every bit of information in the universe flows through them, that there is like we could be taking advantage of that. And so they become yeah. this, uh, this you know, quasi-religious, semi-nefarious, <laughs> absolutely, you know, required part of life. Um, and they, this, they have an interesting part in some place we want to we yeah. include them in the game because I think it's, uh, it's a fun factor. They're, they're basically evil AT&T mixed with the NSA. <laughs> they're like, hey, you can trust us. We're going to deliver that message for you. Hey, uh, we need that planet taken over. Here's a bunch of money we left in a briefcase. Cool, no problem. Oops. Yeah, the the machine's not working today. Uh, I forgot to pray. Yeah, uh, God <laughs> hates you today. It's not working. And then the planet gets taken, and it's like, hey, cool, nice briefcase. Well, hey, do you want us to do the same for you? <laughs> I love your description of uh, uh, evil and uh, evil AT and T combined with the NSA, which is really <laughs> saying evil, evil, evil three times in a row, isn't it? Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I hope that anyone that at this point didn't know or have not went out and, and pledged and supported this game will go out now. Uh, the game is Battletech, and thanks, uh, Jordan, for coming on and talking with us. 
Uh, it's my pleasure, guys. Thanks for the time, and uh, and uh, you know, keep going. I got, I love uh, I love the passion, and uh, you know, it's it's so rewarding to hear. Um, and so I would just appreciate uh, your enthusiasm and all the fans' enthusiasm. We can't make to, can't wait to make a great game. Thank you. Man, we look forward to all your stuff, man. I appreciate that. Take care.